Hey, Sister Walker, God bless you this evening. Sister Quill, God bless you. Hey Denise, love you. Minister Bush. I know Denise is pub. <laughs> Sister Mullins, God bless you. Pug, you need to tell your cousin to, live, to stop. <laughs> Hey, Wayne, bless you, man. Oh, Miller. Linda, minister, God bless you. Deacon Fraser, God bless you tonight. Sister Wilson, God bless you. Sharon, bless you. Hey, Gaina, God bless you. Hey, Auntie. Tucker, bless you. Hey, Cassandra, God bless you. Share it with somebody tonight. I'm real thirsty. Sister Walker. God bless you tonight. Share it with somebody. Share it with somebody tonight. Hey, Deacon Marshall. Bless you, man. Praying for you. The Barnett. Bless you. We're going to let this music play just for a second. Stay right there. I'll be right back. Sorry, family, I'm back. Let him know I'll be through in, a, in about an hour. Sister Hassan, God bless you. 
Apologize for leaving you, family. Anybody know an incredible God? An incredible praise. Hey, Sister Tops. Hey, Granny. Hey, Sister Linda, God bless you. Hey, Beth, God bless you, God bless you. Come on, let's get ready to go to Bible study tonight. Let's see if I can get this thing down. Thank you, Sister Linda, God bless you. Sister Ann, God bless you. I was trying to turn the music off. Somebody needs to surrender right now. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lord. Good evening, everyone. We just want to welcome you to Second Chance Service, um, live, live stream service this evening. We got a few things going on here at the house, but keep praying for us. First, let me, first let me say um, thank you to everyone that was a part of uh, my birthday celebration. Um, you guys are so wonderful as a church family. Um, just thank God for how you blessed me with your, your gifts, your presence, your prayers, how you just love me. And uh, I love you the same. It was a wonderful day. It was wonderful seeing everybody that I was able to make it out to service. I thank God for my family all across the country. My, um, the, on the Aldridge side, on the Light side, my sister, um, my children. I just thank God for all of you. And God bless you. And I just want you to know I love you. And then I just want to thank. Um, remember now that we have um, a food drive tomorrow starting at 9 o'clock. And last Friday... The food drive was amazing because we were in a rainstorm, and I thank God for Local 651 that helped us pass out like 10,000, 10, anywhere from 10 to 15,000 pounds of food uh, in the rain. And we got it done, and I just thank God. So remember, we need volunteers um, tomorrow starting at 9 o'clock if you can make it. If you can't make it and you can just... Um, Share and giving to our recovery app uh, is to help to buy Pampers, to buy bottled water, to buy the, the necessary supplies for our city. We still don't have clean water. I'm just saying that to everybody that's listening. We still don't have clean water in Flint. So don't forget about us without clean water and with the pandemic going on, it makes it uh, tough for people to wash for people to do the necessary things to stay clean, to wear clean masks. Mask. So please think about us. So uh, tonight we want to go into um, another series. And we want to talk tonight about um, 
we can call it faith and healing or taking authority over sickness and disease. Let me pray. Let, me, let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O oh Lord, you are my strength and you are my redeemer. And we love you, Lord. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, with everything that's been going on, I believe that this is a very critical area in this season. Because all of us know someone who is, is, is sick. Or we know someone who has passed. We know what the statistics, the statistics are saying about this pandemic right now. So in my prayer time, in my meditation time, God began to have me to look at how we as Christians believe God for our, our, our healing. So it's critical for us as Christians to believe that sickness should never consume our lives. Because the Bible says you cannot have two masters. So we have to learn how to take authority in the area of sickness and disease. And we have to trust God in the area of healing in our lives, our children's lives, and the families around us. With our children being exposed to this pandemic, we have to exercise our faith and our authority like we've never exercised it before. So the first thing we want to say is the more word you get, the more word you get, the more Bible you get, the more word you get, hmm, on healing, the more you will trust God in the area of healing in your life. If you're not getting a word regarding this area, you're not going to have the faith to stand against it. So let's make a declaration, a declaration as we move through these uncertain times. So the first thing is, even though I have to take medications, I'm not claiming sickness. Matter of fact, what I'm saying every day is that I'm not the sick trying to get well, but I'm the heal based on the word of God and my faith. Remember that. I'm not the sick trying to get well, but I'm the healed based on the word of God and my faith. So today we want to set some groundwork of talking about where sickness comes from. So we have to go back to the beginning. Before we go there, let me share something with you about the power of God and faith. Because I said, if you get a word on healing, you start believing God for it. There was something that happened in Luke 5 and 17. And we're just going to use this as a reference. And we're going to come back to this later on. And so the Bible says in Luke 5 and 17, that one day as he was teaching, Pharisees and Sadducees, or teachers of the law, who had come from every village of Galilee was, and from Judah and Jerusalem was sitting there. What was Jesus doing? He was teaching. A word was going forth. So here's what I want you to focus. It says the power of the Lord was present for him to heal the sick. So while teaching was going forth, while the word was going forth, we can assume that faith was being built up. And because faith was being built up, it created an environment for the power of God to heal. So what this teaches me is that there is an, is, is an environment that can be created when my faith has been increased in any area of my life. I believe that my, my faith can be so strong, so rooted in the word of God. And if everybody that is live streaming this evening has the same level of faith, people can be healed just by tuning in this evening. People can come on this live stream and because of all of us believing and praying for healing that anybody can be healed. Nobody has to lay their hands on you. You don't have to be in a church. Nobody has to slay you in the spirit, but you can be right where you are right now. And if your faith is strong and all the rest of us are agreeing in faith, I know that you can be healed. 
And I know for some of you that may be a strange thing to believe, but I'm telling you, people of God, that there's a place of faith that when you're around people that have the same kind of faith and they put prayer with it and God's word is going forth and healing, that people that you don't even know, but you're connected to through, through, through live stream are getting their healing right now. But the first thing you have to do is come out of your usual idea about worship. You have to come out of your norm of how we used to worship and believe that God blessed us to be able to get the same blessing on live stream that you got while you were in church. He, he, he's taking us to another level. This is, this is true worship. How many of you believe that this can happen? Jesus says that these signs shall follow them that believe. We should not be chasing signs. They should be following us. Where are the miracles since we're not in the house of God right now? Where are the healing since we're not in the house of God? So I want to go back to the primary reference that's in Genesis 1 and 31. And I'm reading out an NIV version of the Bible. Genesis 1 and 31. The Bible says, God saw all that he had made and it was very good and there was evening and there was morning the sixth day so on the sixth day God finished his work and he looked back at everything that he had made in the garden and God congratulated himself and God said that everything I made is in proper alignment is, is whole. Everything I did was good. So what we can assume is when God made Adam and Eve, there was no sickness. Think about that. When God made Adam and Eve, there was no sickness. And that's how God intended for it to be. Everything was in proper alignment. So if sickness was present in the garden and God said everything was good, that would make sickness good. So we know that every good and perfect gift comes from God. So when God made it, it was perfect and it was good. So God had a perfect environment in the Garden of Eden. So right now we're dealing with the beginning of time. So the reality is that God never intended for you and I to be sick in our bodies. But God intended for you and I to have physical health so that our soul and our spirit be, would be healthy as well. 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23 says, 1 Thessalonians 5 and 23, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Total healing. My soul, my spirit, and my body. Uh, a better way of reading that would be 3 John 2. Dear friend, I pray that you may enjoy good health and that all may go well with you, even as your soul is getting along well. So what God is saying that my desire for you is that you not be broke, you not be sick, and that you go to heaven. God is saying that my desire for all of us is that we are not broke, we're not sick, and we go to heaven. So if that is God's desire for us, not to be broke, not to be sick, and not to go to hell, then the devil's objective is that you be broke, you be sick, and you go to hell. So God's desire is that I'm blessed in every area of my life. So let's find out how sickness came into the world. Death was passed to all men, and all women. Romans 5, 12 through 14. Paul says, therefore, listen to what Paul says. Paul says, therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin. Somebody say death passed through sin. And in this way, death came to all men because all sinned. Now, were any of us there when Adam sinned? But death passed to all of us through one man, Adam. 
Then verse 13 says, For before the law was given, sin was in the world. But sin is not taken into account where there is no law. Nevertheless, I'm in verse 14 now. Nevertheless, death reigned from the time of Adam to the time of Moses, even over those who did not sin by breaking a command as did Adam, who was a pattern of the one to come. Now, I'm going to go back to Genesis 2 and 17. And Genesis 2 and 17 says, But you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. God is talking to Adam and Eve. He says, I got a perfect environment for you to live in. You can have whatever you want, and you're going to live forever as long as you don't touch the tree of knowledge, because the day you touch it, you're going to die. God warns them, don't touch that tree because the day you touch it, you're going to die. Now, now I want you to look at Genesis 3 and 17. I'm giving you a bunch of scriptures, but I know my daughter Lakeisha is going to put them on the live stream on our Facebook page so you can see them. But if you get a chance, write them down. Genesis 3 and 17 says, after they had sinned, God said to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree which I told you not to eat from. Curse is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat of it all the days of your life. By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. So because of sin, Adam and Eve got banned from the garden and everything was cursed. So the day that Adam and Eve ate of the fruit, they didn't die right away. But what they did is they kick-started death. That's how death came in through sin. So the moment sin came in, death came shortly after it. So now the devil is already upset because he's been kicked out of heaven. So he comes down to this earth. He's the prince of the power of the air. And I want you to see the devil like this. I want you to a picture in your mind the devil's like this. He has keys to death and hell. Uh, I, I, I want you to look at the devil like somebody in the beginning that's got a condo in hell that are vacant and he's looking for occupants. He's got condo condos that he's trying to fill in hell because he doesn't have any occupants. So the devil says that God has Adam and Eve hooked up. They're going to live forever. So if I can just get them to sin, they will die and I'll have my first tenants for my condos. How do you move somebody that has life to death? You need something to ferry them between the two. So that you so that would have to be sin. Because once you sin, my Bible says the wages of sin is death. So all sin, all sin eventually leads to death. Every sin that you engage in leads to some death. And that's how sickness gets in the middle of sin and death. Now, let me share this with you. I, I'm not saying that everybody that is sick has sinned. I, that's, I am not saying that. Or is sinning. Let's make that clear. Because if everybody that is sick has sinned, all of us that are live streaming tonight would be coughing. Some of us would be coughing worse than others. And if that was the case, I'd probably be on life support right now. But at the same time, I'm not the kind of pastor that's going to tell you that you're not going to get sick. But you have to take authority over your sickness. I'm trying to help you understand a biblical principle. The devil will use sin to bring sickness, which can lead to death. Let me see if I can give you an example. Every sin you commit, the wages of sin are death. Every sin you commit will ride sickness to your death. So prove what you're saying, D.A. So it's not a sin to, to have a drink. But if you keep getting drunk, if you keep drinking and you start getting drunk and you become an alcoholic, then that sin will grab hold of your liver and your kidneys and your other organs, and that will eventually, eventually take you out of here. Death. Keep doing meth. Keep doing cocaine. You're going to lose your mind or blow yourself up and ride yourself into death. Keep smoking them cigarettes or those cigars. 
until you smoke, until you have a tumor on your lungs that can kill you. Keep using that salt shaker and eating that greasy pork in your greens. It will ride you to death. So the devil says, if I can get you in that place outside the will of God, I can take from you what God intended for you to have. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now here's some shouting news. Jesus undid at Calvary what the devil did in the garden. That's the blessing. Everything that the devil did in Genesis, Jesus undid at Calvary. Glory. Somebody say glory to God. In 1 John 3 and 8, this is a real blessing to me. He who does what, what is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning, the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. See, the devil had the keys to death and hell, but when Jesus died on the cross, Jesus took the keys of death back, and Jesus said, I died that my people might have life. Jesus took authority over death and the grave. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Oh, grave, where is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. Thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Therefore, be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord because your labor is not in vain. So, so, so if you're in a relationship with him who died and has risen again and taken authority over death and the grave, Though the wages of sin are death, the gift of God is eternal life, which means eternal life starts the minute you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. See, a lot of us were taught that eternal life starts when you die. But I want you to understand that you're supposed to be living your best life now. You're living your best life now. You're supposed to be living your best life now. And then my next life gets even better because I go from glory to glory, which means I just go from life to life because you can be born once and die twice or you can be born twice and die once. God says you can live the life I have for you. You can take authority over sickness and disease. God's desire for us is to live the, 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 the best life we can live down here on earth. That's God's desire for our lives. He has come that you and I may have life and have it more abundantly. See, you've been taught that I'm supposed to live down here and struggle with sickness and disease and be broke. But one glad morning when this life is over, I'll fly away. The devil is a liar. Let me tell you about me. I want to get some practice down here because I don't want to be out of place when I get to heaven. I want to get my rehearsal in right here. That's why I praise him down here because that, because that is the rehearsal of what I got to do when I get to heaven. That's why I want to be blessed down here because I know that I'm going to be blessed when I get up there. Somebody say amen. So the same faith that you have for salvation, listen to this. So the same faith that you have for salvation is the same faith that you have to use for your healing. How many of you know without a shallow, without a doubt in your mind that you're saved? How many of you know that you are saved and filled with the Holy Ghost? I mean, there's not the slightest doubt in your mind about your salvation. Now I have a question for you. What are you saved from? If I'm saved, then the question is, what am I saved from? I know what I'm saved to. I'm saved to go to heaven. So if I'm saved to go to heaven, then I'm saved from the penalty of sin, which is death. So then death is a result of sin and sickness rides death. So what I have to understand is the whole understanding of soteriology, soteriology, a big word. The definition of soteriology is the doctrine of salvation. So salvation says if he can save my soul, he can save me from whatever disease or sickness that I might have. 
Listen to what Isaiah says in Isaiah 53 and 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought peace was upon him, and by his wounds or by his stripes, we are healed. Somebody say, we are healed. At the moment Jesus died, I was healed. Before I got sick, before I got weak, before I got in poor health, I was healed. So regardless, regardless of my situation, I know what he did at Calvary healed me. That's why I say I'm not the sick trying to get healed. I know that I was healed at Calvary. I just have to start walking in what he did at Calvary. Let's see. There's this idea that physical healing is closely tied to deliverance and, um, or, or the forgiveness of sins. And if you read the, 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 the New Testament, you'll see this on multiple occasions where the Pharisees and the Sadducees would come up to Jesus and say, did this man sin? Is that why he's sick? Was it something he's done? But I've already told you that's not our issue. Because there are a variety of reasons we get sick. We have all kinds of viruses and sicknesses going on in this world right now. And that's why God led us into this word on sickness and healing. Because if no one talks about what we're going through, how are we going to know how to deal with the things that we go through in life? So there is a variety, variety of reasons we get sick. And I'm going to talk about them through this series. Some sickness we bring on ourselves because of our bad habits. Some sickness is to the glory of God. There is a relationship between forgiveness of sins, deliverance, and healing. In Psalms 103, verse 3, it says, Who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases? See, we as church people will tell people that I don't care what you've done. I don't care how long you've done it. Jesus Christ can save you. You will tell people that I don't care what you've been caught up in. Jesus can turn your life around. You just have to say your ABCs. You just accept the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe that God raised him from the dead. Confess that with your mouth and you shall be saved. You tell people that all the time, that they can be saved and it's just that simple. How many believe that he can save you no matter what you've done? So why can't you say, I don't care what the doctor says about my condition. I don't care who died of it. I don't care what happens in the United States. I don't care how many cases there are now. If you have faith to believe it, God has the power to do it. I'm just saying. If, it, if, it's, if it's his will, he will do it. James 5 and 15 says, And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he will be forgiven. Look at the relationship between faith being made well and being forgiven of your sins. So there are certain requirements to obtain our physical healing. The first thing you must do is you must desire to be healed. Now, that sounds kind of crazy. Because most of us listening says that everybody that's sick wants to be healed. But I just want you to know that some people are guilty of embracing their sickness. Have you ever heard somebody talk like this? You ask them how they're doing. Child, I'm doing all right, but my back hurting me today. How you doing? Well, well, these migraines, really, man, and my sugar is up. Lord, my arthritis, Lord, I'm just falling apart. All this medication the doctor is giving me because they have embraced their, their sickness. And their sickness has become a part of who they are. Their sickness becomes so much a part of who they are that they're labeled by their sickness. You remember there was a certain woman with the issue of blood? Well, what's her name? The woman with the issue of blood. There were lepers. What's their name? Lepers. So every time people see you, they see you as the sick one. And for 20 years, you've been sick. And every time we see you, you are embracing a different sickness. Because when you embrace sickness all the time, you want to pass for a lot of things in life. Have you noticed, have you noticed, have you noticed, hmm, have you noticed how people run 
I mean, they run and jump in those Amigos right around in the store. They run to get to the Amigos. They run to get to the Amigos. If you can run to get in an Amigo, what's wrong with you slowly walking around the store getting a little exercise? Stop letting the conveniences of life cheat you out of your healing. We do the same thing with handicap stickers and handicap spaces. When we can walk five steps to the store rather than we getting the first parking spot coming up. If we don't ever do anything to get better, we're never going to get better. We cheat ourselves. So we like accommodations to be made for us when we're not feeling well. We accommodate our sicknesses. So we end up being a victim all of our lives and you want people to feel sorry for you. But God gave you the authority to take power over that sickness and not to live in that space in your life. Don't spend time looking for people to feel sorry for you. Matthew 20, verse 30, 33. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside and when they heard. Listen to what I just said. Matthew 20, verses 30, 33. Two men. Two blind men were sitting by the roadside, and when they heard, faith come by hearing, hearing by the word of God, that Jesus was going by. They shouted, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. And look what happened in verse 31. The crowd said, shut up and told them to be quiet, but they shouted all the loud, louder. They kept crying out. Look at Mark 10, 46. It says, as Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, a blind man, Barnabas, was sitting by the roadside begging. Verse 47 says, when he heard, faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. That it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. In verse 47, people said, would you shut up, man? The man is busy. But Barnabas kept crying out even more. When you know where your answer is, you refuse to allow people to discourage you from your healing. If there's anything you can learn is that faith puts me in position to get my miracle. Faith puts me in position to get my miracle. Faith puts me in position to get my healing. You have to have so much faith in this season that in the midst of naysayers, in the midst of all the statistics, if you know where your help comes from and Jesus is your help, you're, gonna, you're not going to let nothing stop you from getting your healing. But you have to believe that he's able to heal. Is there anybody listening that really knows that he's able today? He's able to heal. In Matthew 8 and 5, it says a centurion came to Jesus asking for help for his paralyzed servant who was suffering. And in verse 13, and I know I'm kind of jumping around right now, but Jesus said to the centurion, go, it will be done just as you believed. And, it, and the Bible says, and his servant was healed at that very hour. Again, the centurion came to Jesus because he believed that Jesus had the power and authority to heal. And the centurion's faith in Jesus was so strong that he told Jesus that you don't even have to come to my house. All you have to do is speak a word. And that's where our faith needs to be, that we have the faith through the power of the risen Savior that all that needs to happen is that a word is spoken in faith and it will be done. The Bible says no man comes to God unless he believes that God is and that he rewards those who diligently seek him. That's Hebrews 11 and 6. Now, thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let's go to Luke 17 and 19. Let's focus there just for a moment. Jesus says to a man, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. So it's really about my faith. It's really about whether I believe God can heal. So why do I keep pressing this one point? Because the devil specializes in getting us in a place of isolation so he can interrogate us and make us believe that God can, will not keep his promises. So you'll start watching the news or reading the reports 
and start forgetting what God's word is and start believing what the devil is telling you. So it really comes down to obedience. Sometimes our healings are based on condition. It really deals with us walking in obedience. Later this evening or tomorrow, I want you to read Leviticus, the 26th chapter, or Deuteron and Deuteronomy, the 28th chapter. Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. And what you will discover is that in those, in those chapters, you will hear the Lord saying, if you obey me, obey what I tell you to do. God says, I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to heal your body. God says, I'm going to do all of these amazing things for you if you just obey. Isaiah 58, 8, God is talking about fasting in, in, Isaiah, in Isaiah in this chapter. And he says, if you fast like I asked you to fast, he says, then your light will break forth like the dawn, and your healing will quickly appear. How many of you know that God can do a quick work when he gets ready? Let me share something with you. I want to give you a list of things while you're walking in faith for your healing or for somebody else's healing. I want you to write them down. I'll make sure my wonderful daughter, Lakeisha, list them on our page. Some things that I just want you to do. Number one, if you're going through right now, don't let frustration take over your life. You'll end up like Job's wife. She was not even sick, but she ended up frustrated about Job's situation. When you become frustrated, you begin to question God about things you should not be questioning him about. Job, Job, Job's wife told him that he ought to curse God and die. She sounds like somebody that was frustrated. Frustrations make you start to doubt God and, and then you stop reading his word and you stop worshiping God. Then you stop having faith. Then your imagination kicks in and you become paranoid about everything and everybody. The second point, in this season, you can't be afraid. Let's be honest. When we see bad things happening, we become afraid. Well, the issue is that God does not give us a spirit of fear. So fear comes from the devil. So fear is rooted in imaginations. Fear will have you sing your funeral because you have a cold. Lord Jesus, this is it. Their flu's not working. I'm not getting any better. In this season, you cannot show fear if you have faith. Faith and fear cannot occupy the same space. And I know, I know with COVID out there, there are a lot of people afraid, but if it's God's will, you cannot stop COVID from visiting your house. So don't live life being afraid. Be safe, be vigilant, but do not be afraid. God is a very present help in a time of trouble. I hope that makes sense. Number three, don't let sickness make you desperate. Being desperate will make you do some real stupid stuff. Well, the medicine's not working, so I'll buy everything I see on TV. Uh, or I'll try every remedy that I see on somebody's Facebook page, like shooting up bleach for COVID. I'll find me some witch doctor to blow some dust in my face. What's wrong with you? You have to believe God's word. Don't become desperate. Number four, never lose confidence in the word of God. You got too much word in you. You have to hang tight on what God has promised you. You're going to have some days where you're not feeling it. Days are all, not always going to be the way you want them to be. And, you, and when you're praying for your healing, but never lose your confidence. Don't ever give up on your confidence of what God's word says it's going to do. The fifth thing, get as much word on healing as you can. Listen to sermons you got. Get you some books on healing. I thank God for sermons on how you're going to get a house or how you're going to get a car. But you need a, a healing. There's nothing you can do with a new house and a new car and you're sick. They're not going to make you feel any better. You have to stay rooted in the word about healing. You got to stay rooted in the word of God. Then you need to act like the word says, by his stripes, I am healed. Act like you heal. 
Walk like you heal. Talk like you heal. When you wake up in the morning, claim that you're feeling well. When you're sick, encourage somebody else. You got to act like it's so. Now let the poor say I'm rich and let the sick say I'm healed. You have to look the opposite of what you're going through. And then the last thing is give God glory for your healing every day, no matter how you feel. Praise your way through. Some days I know that you roll out of bed and, and don't feel good. See, I just... Hmm. I just celebrated another birthday, and I can, remember, I can remember when I was young, I used to jump up out of bed and go on about my business, and as I got a little older, I would sit up and think about it, and then after I got a little older, I would get up and thank God if nothing was hurting me. Now, 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 when I wake up, I thank him first for waking me up. Then when I stand up and get my balance and I check myself out, I'm actually thinking about getting a bed real, but I've learned how to give God glory when nothing new is hurting me. So, so remember to thank God and celebrate every day you can wake up because a lot of people didn't wake up today. So I'm going to close with this story on healing. John 5, 1 through 9. There was a feast of the Jews. And the Bible says in Jerusalem near the sheep gate, <clears throat> a pool which is which in Aramaic is called Bethesda, which was surrounded by five covered colonnades. So by the pool lay a great number of disabled and sick people. They had all kinds of conditions. Some were lame, some were blind, some were paralyzed. And they were all waiting on the moving of the water. Because what would happen is during a certain season, an angel would come down and stir up the water. And whoever would be in the pool first would be healed from whatever sickness that they had. Everybody in this place is waiting on their miracle. Everybody is in crisis. Everybody wants their turn. And what happens is when the angel comes down and stirs the water, only one person gets healed. Can you imagine what that is like when others see somebody else get healed and they don't get theirs, when others get their breakthrough and you're still going through what you're going through. That's when you have to suck it up and not be a hater. But you're like, Lord, when is my time coming? Have you ever been there before? And it can be frustrating. But my Bible says there was a man that had been there for 38 years years, 38 years, 38 years. He was in the same place waiting on what everybody else was waiting on. So my Bible says that out of all the people there in verse six, that Jesus saw him lying there. This is what messed me up. I just want you to know this evening that Jesus sees you. So what, what, what is it about this man that made Jesus see him? Because the man's attitude was that even though I've been here for 38 years, I'm going to keep coming back. The man had decided that he was not giving up on the process. He decided that he was going to keep trying. Even though others are getting their healing, I'm not going to hate. I'm not giving up because one day it's going to be my day. Because Jesus knows what we need even before we ask. Jesus knew that this man had been in a predicament for a long time. And I just want somebody listening to know that Jesus knows what you're going through. It may not seem like he knows, but trust me, Jesus has his eye on you this evening. So what makes this story interesting is Jesus asked this man a question. And he's asking us the same question today. Do you want to be made well? And that's a strange question to ask somebody that's been sick for 38 years. And I know that some of you may have been sick for months, but 38 years? It seems like the answer would be obvious. But Jesus asked, do you want to be made well? Listen to the man's answer. I have no one to help me in the pool when the water is stirred. Jesus says, do you want to be made well? He's talking to us this evening. Well, the doctor says only a certain percentage of people survive what I got. Jesus says, do you want to be made well 
Well, what I have is hereditary. My grandma and my grandpa died, both died from this. Do you want to be made well? Jesus says, I'm not trying to hear your explanation of your sickness. I, I did not ask you to give me data. I did not ask you about your condition. I am the life. Jesus is saying, I'm standing before you this evening. He says, I'm standing before you this evening asking you, do you want to be made well? Stop bringing up excuses. Stop changing the conversation. Stop trying to figure out how he's going to do it. Jesus does not respond to the man's excuse. It seems like he takes into account how long this man has been in this condition. Because when you've been sick for a long time, you begin to sound like what you feel like. So Jesus says in the next verse, he says, get up, pick up your bed and walk. Get up. Take power and authority over what has you down and walk out of here. They carried you in, but you're going to walk out of here. You came in here codependent on people, but you're going to leave here codependent on me. Get up and, and, and get up and take what you were laying on and walk out of here and start holding what you've been holding. And the next verse says that once the man was cured, he picked up his bed and he walked. The man is laying on his bed. He's been laying there for 38 years. Others have gotten in before him, but he's still there. Jesus shows up and he's laying down. Jesus looks down at him and says, rise, take up your bed and walk. The moment Jesus said it, he was healed. All he had to do was get up and walk into what Jesus had already spoken. Some of you don't realize that you're already healed. You just won't get up and walk in it because you've been listening to the negative reports. Don't let anybody claim sickness on you. I want you this evening to get up and walk in your healing. Once the word went forth, he was already healed. And I just want you to know tonight, so are you. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace, for your tender kindness. We Thank you for healing. We just ask that you would just be with somebody that's listening tonight. And we ask you to strengthen their faith. And right now they're getting up. They're not feeling sorry for themselves. They're not listening to negative reports. If it's not them that's not feeling well, they're praying for whoever it is, their spouse, their children. Lord, we just ask for covering today. And we ask for you to strengthen our faith as we walk through this series about healing and getting through disease and getting through these times, these troubled times that we're going through. So we just ask you to cover us and bless us right now and comfort us. But we ask you to allow your word to saturate us, our heads, our minds, our souls, our hearts, our spirit. Just let your word saturate us right now, Lord. Let your word be so, so permeated through us that when somebody sees us, that the word just springs out at them and they're healed. And anybody that comes in contact with us gets their healing today. Lord, we're getting up. We're going to walk. We're going to release sickness. Since Christ died, for us at Calvary, we've been set free, and we thank you for mercy and grace. In Jesus' name, we give you all the praise and all the glory, and we all say amen, and God bless. Love you. God bless you. Thank you for coming in. Hope to see you Sunday morning. Don't forget, you have been healed. Have a good night.